Willkommen zu diesem Vortrag. Welcome to this talk. My name is Antonio Rojas Castro and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Youth Humanities in the Berlin Brandenburgische Akademie der Wissenschaften. Today I'm going to give a talk titled Fair Enough, Building Digital Humanities Resources in an Unequal World. Before starting, I would like to thank Frederick Neuber and Christian Thomas for the invitation and for allowing me to deliver my talk in English as part of the Digital Humanities Colloquium. I would like also to thank Jennifer Isassi and David Risley for helping me to improve my slides. With this talk, I aim to establish a dialogue with previous interventions that critique the digital humanities as a universalist, not situated and scientific field whose epistemological frameworks, methods and tools can be applied anywhere, anytime and under all conditions. To do so, I will analyze and interrogate the fair principles initiated by Force 11. As you already know, these principles are findability, accessibility, interoperability and re reusability. I will use my experience as editor for the Programme Historian in Espanol and as a DH uh, developer for Proyecto Humboldt Digital to illustrate these principles, but also to challenge them. The Programme Historian aims to publish his tutorials in English, Spanish, French and Portuguese soon about digital methods addressed to historians who want to learn new skills. In contrast, Proyecto Humboldt Digital aims to digitize and make accessible online a collection of records and documents preserved in libraries and, and archives in Cuba that are connected somehow with Alexander von Humboldt travel, travels uh, to Cuba in the 19th century. Although these breaks may look rather different, actually they are both interdisciplinary, intercultural, multilingual, and they intend to use the internet as an open platform to increase the access to knowledge. I also think they can be perceived as true examples of digital humanities projects um, enabled by the cooperation of people that live in the global north and the global south. The content of this talk is divided in four parts. First, I will talk briefly about our present situation after COVID-19, because I think that it is important to remark some continued tweets, despite that we may think that we have experienced an unseen crisis without any precedent. Second, I will highlight three critical interventions in order to give an overview of previous works that have contested the vision of the other humanities as a field defined by its practical nature, based on building in, op in opposition to thinking and criticizing. Third, I will analyze the FAIR principles and its 15 facets, using my experience from the Programme Historian in Espanol and Proyecto Humboldt Digital in order to illustrate and or challenge these principles. Fourth, I would present three dangers that I think any digital humanities project that requires the cooperation between people based in the Global North and the Global South should avoid by all means. Finally, I will close this presentation with some conclusions that hopefully can be applicable to any digital project that has a global, multilingual and intercultural scope. In recent months, we have lived an, ex an extraordinary experience. COVID-19 has forced to isolate ourselves and to work remotely and has reduced our movement. As Boaventura de Sousa Santos argues in his recent book, The Cruel Pedagogy of the Virus, COVID-19 has taught us several lessons. One of the most important is that we live in an interconnected world. In fact, the etymology of pandemic is the reunion, reunion of the people. This reunion, however, is shaped by previous inequalities that stem from capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy since 16th century. For instance, We have seen how valuable it is to have access to digital resources online for learning while we were confined at home. But resources of all kinds and digital access to them are not evenly distributed. We can ask ourselves who can decide not to go to work, who is essential, and who is taking care of the sick while we remain at home. From a geopolitical point of view, COVID-19 has also shown us some inequalities clearer. Sosa Santos states that Epidemics, the new coronavirus is the most recent manifestation of them, only become a serious global problem when the populations of the richer countries of the global north are affected. This is what happened with AIDS. In 2016, malaria killed 400,000 
people, the vast majority in Africa, and that was not news. In other words, this virus has reminded us, especially to those based in Europe, that we live already in an unequal world. For this reason, in the following section, I would like to engage with three critical interventions in the field of the digital humanities that have already addressed this problem. Since 2011, when Alan Liu asked in his blog, where is cultural criticism in the digital humanities, we have witnessed several reactive contributions that aim to discuss the limits of the field, unmask its inequality and oppressions, and interrogate the production of knowledge. The first critical intervention that I would like to highlight is a book titled The Digital Humanist, a Critical Inquiry by Domenico Fulermonte, Teresa Numerico, and Francesca Tomasi. Originally published in Italian and translated into English in 2015, it offers a comprehensive study of the politics and methods of the digital humanities. I find extremely useful the expression the digital humanities divide to speak about five issues that stand in the way of a more democratic and genuinely multicultural development. The digital divide, that is the lack of access to internet and digital skills to use information technologies. It may exist, as you may know, within a, or between countries. Two, um, the governance of digital structures from local institutions to worldwide organizations like W3C or ISO, organizations that are traditionally governed by scholars and professionals based in the global north and that speak mostly in English. Three, the development of standards by organizations like Unicode Consortium or smaller ones like the TI. Four, the code hegemony, that is the dominance of multinational private groups like Microsoft, Google, Apple or Facebook. Five, the relationship between the governance, structure and multicultural gender and linguistic issues and the representation of minorities in the field of the digital humanities. The second critical intervention that I want to discuss is not a book but a group initiative. Global Outlook DH is a special interest group from the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations that aims to help break down barriers that hinder communication and collaboration among researchers and students of the digital arts, humanities, and cultural heritage sectors in high, mid, and low income economies. The group has, very active, has been very active in connecting people and has also developed some in interesting projects like Around the Age in 80 Days to raise awareness of the existence of DH work going on around the globe, or the working group known as Minimal Computing. Minimal computing refers to computing done under some set of significant constraints of hardware, software, education, network capacity, power, or other factors. I personally find the minimal computing idea very attractive when building data humanities resources in the global south. This group initiative has also been very important in the recent development of the field and has helped to counterbalance the power structures within AADHO. For instance, in 2018, the annual conference of digital humanities took place in the city of Mexico. It has also helped to decenter the field from its Anglo-American roots and give voice to scholars living in the borderlands, as Earhart and Del Rio have argued recently. Earhart um, states that rather than initiating a one-size-fits-all global model, we need to imagine a global digital humanities that live, lives in the borderlands a place of connection and contradiction, and most importantly, a place that doesn't try to centralize itself. In fact, Jimena del Rio also brings this idea of borderland and actually uses to define the field. She says that the digital humanities build border objects and also live in the borderlands. If previous interventions have discussed power, economic and social inequalities, the last critical intervention that I would like to point to focuses on violence in technology and the digital record. According to Nobel, the landscape of information and communication technology, including the tools used in DH projects, are fully implicated in racialized violence and environmental destruction, from extraction to production and from consumption to disposal of digital technologies. Violence is also present in colonial archives and can be replicated when digitizing collections. This is why recent Rissam argues that data archives need, needs to resist um, colonial violence in content and method, mediating in the gaps and silences in the digital cultural record that can be filled with extant sources. To sum up, 
This critical intervention not only aims to go beyond um, fair representation by adding minority, minority or racialized uh, groups, but also to interrogate hegemonic practices and knowledge production. Now, it may seem contradictory that in a talk about building, I have spent five minutes talking about criticism in digital humanities. This can be true if we understand building in opposition to criticizing, but my experience confirms that building is criticizing because we cannot build digital resources without a critical engagement with technologies. Simultaneously, I think that criticizing is also building because the critique is always an instrument to create new alternative ways of being in the world, seeing the reality or using technology. So, in the following section, I will try to engage critically with the FAIR principles. My first encounter with the FAIR principles took place one year ago when I started working for Proyecto Humboldt Digital. One of my tasks consists in designing a digital workflow to produce a digital repository with digital surrogates and metadata. So I started looking for international recommendations and best practices published by library and archival institutions. However, since the execution of this part of the project is undertaken in Cuba, it was clear for me two things. One, that I needed to design the full workflow together with my Cuban colleagues, and two, that many technical requirements that we in the global north are given by granted, they may be more difficult to realize in, the, in Cuba due to the digital gap. The four principles are four, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. The term managed to cle cleverly and implicitly encapsulate the notion of justice and a suite of technical requirements or properties. They are guiding principles to build, and resources, but somehow they also serve as guidelines for evaluation. These guiding principles were created by Force 11 in 2014 and have gained momentum after being endorsed by the European Commission and by organizations like LIBER or RDA. The FIP principles are addressed to both machines or computers and humans and can be applied to datasets, metadata, tools, vocabularies, infrastructure, etc. In other words, to any digital resource typically built by digital humanities practitioners. The four principles are described in simple sentences and seem easy to implement. However, each principle has a series of um, sub-elements that expand the meaning and make it concrete, as we will see. In total, there are four principles and 15 facets. As other researchers have previously argued, the 15 facets of the FAIR principles are all short sentences. Their brevity gives the impression that they are all items that can be checked off. However, our analysis shows that the FAIR principles are much trickier than this. In fact, I think these principles are subject to interpretation and debate. Furthermore, if they are to be implemented in a cooperation project like Project Humboldt Digital, I believe that these principles must be negotiated to benefit both parties to the project. This is why I, haven't, I have titled my contribution with a question, fair enough, because I believe that the manner in which we build and evaluate digital resources depends on the context and needs of each community. In the following slides, I will question the four principles and their facets and illustrate the ideas with examples from the Programme Historia en Español and Proyecto Humboldt Digital, while outlining some challenges and difficulties. The first principle that a digital resource must follow to be fair is to be findable. This principle has four facets. First, metadata and data are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. Second, data are described with a rich metadata defined by another facet. Three, Metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data it describes. Four, metadata and data are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. This principle seems easy to follow. However, I think we can point out three difficulties. Firstly, persistent identifiers are not free. That is, they cost money. Second, I think the term rich for describing metadata is too vague. Does this mean that resources should be described with descriptive metadata only, or should we include administrative, technical, and preservation metadata? Finally, in order for an external resource to index content created in a digital humanities project, 
scans, data sessions, or tutorials, for example, a set of standards defined by other projects must be followed. And this is not easy to achieve, because many times this type of policy was not taken into account in, in, in the initial design. As an example of the first facet, we can use the Program Historian. As I said, this is a resource that publishes tutorials. It was created in 2008, and in 2012 it became a kind of a scholarly journal with peer review. However, none of the published tutorials had a persistent identifier until 2020. This is largely because persistent identifiers cost money and our project was not funded until very recently. In 2019, we began accepting donations and collecting money through Patreon. In other words, in the case of the programming historian, there is a correlation between funding and the use of persistent identifiers. Something similar can be said about handles. In the context of the project of Humboldt Digital, we are building a digital repository with digitizations and metadata. We would like each record to have a persistent identifier, but again, we have the financial problem. As you see in this slide, handles require an initial subscription of uh, $50 and the annual payment of another $50 per prefix. The sum may seem small for institutions in the global north. However, for a Cuban institution, the cost is certainly high, to the point that we may wonder whether the digital repository really needs persistent identifiers. Personally, I think so, but it's not a problem that has a universal solution. The second facet I'd like to question is data are described with uh, rich metadata. We all know the role and importance of metadata to identify resources, but also to retrieve information in digital repositories. In this slide, you can see a screenshot of the header of a tutorial published by the Program Historian. We provide information about the title, the authors, a description, the license of use, other contributors, such as editor, reviewers, or translators, some relevant dates um, of the life of the resource, and keywords. In other words, it is easy to describe resources with metadata in order to allow identification and use. We just need time and a knowledge to implement the description. This is done by the tutorial editor. It is more difficult, I think, to add technical, administrative or preservation metadata. In fact, in this project, we, we do not do it. So it's, it is worth asking if we comply with the facets um, that are described with rich metadata. Now, on the home page, um, the metadata we use to filter the lessons is not typical. As you can see in this slide, the tutorials can be filtered by activity and keyword, and then sorted by difficulty and date of publication. In addition, there is the possibility of searching for words. By this, I mean that to use this type of digital resource, it, it is not so important to filter by the name of the author, editor, reviewer, or translator. I think this particularity can be put in relation to alternative ways of building digital repositories, especially when these resources focus on issues such as slavery or colonialism. This is an area that has concerned me since I started working for Proyecto Homo Digital, because if no explicit measures are taken, it is very easy to replicate dominant power structures. For example, when selecting documents to digitize or when describing these um, digitizations. In this sense, I think it is worth remembering the words of Amalia Levy. She says, Archival description and metadata favor the creator. People who have traditionally not created what is considered a record are rarely included in the archives. Even when they are included, marginalized populations, such as enslaved, do not exist as creators of documents. Instead, instead they can be found as items in an enslaved ship's cargo list a plantation's holdings, an owner's will, or a newspaper's runaway ad. In other words, I think we have to intervene directly in the decolonization of archives with the aim of not privileging authors or creators, but instead subjects through keywords or hidden headings. The last facet of the first principle I would like to question is metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. Most digital resources today are found by searching on Google or through social media, such as Twitter. In fact, most of the users of Programming Historian already know us and visit us again by typing our URL or by using Google. But digital resources can also be found through portals that aggregate metadata. This is the case, for example, with um, OER Commons, 
with indexes open educational resources. The inclusion, the inclusion in this case is very simple, or was very simple, because the platform accepts um, submissions from registered users. The editors of the programming historian created a registry and gave the link for users to find us. It has been more difficult instead for the directory of open access journals to include the programming historian. Currently, the English tutorials are indexed, but the French and Spanish versions are not. The reason we have received is that the translated tutorials are not original enough. This is due, I think, to a misunderstanding about the nature of the translation. In many cases, they are adaptions with many changes from the original. In addition, the program historian in Espanol has begun to produce original tutorials in Spanish, which are not yet available in the English version and are therefore not indexed in the directory of open access journal. The second fair principle I want to discuss here is to be accessible. This principle has two main facets. First, metadata and data are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized method. This method or protocol is open, free, and universally implementable. Moreover, the protocol allows for an, an authentication and authorization procedure where necessary. The second, um, the second facet is metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. The, the first facet is quite simple to follow. You simply have to publish the resources on the internet using the hypertext um, transfer protocol, HTTP. I believe, though, that the FAIR principles focus only on the technical aspects. While it is true that this protocol can be implemented universally, in reality there is a digital divide that prevents online publishing. In other words, I believe that the FAIR principles ignore the human, social and economic aspects of the technology. To illustrate this criticism, I would like to show you a map of internet access around the world according to data collected by the World Data Bank. As you can see, internet access is not the same in every country. In fact, it can be argued that in rich countries, a large majority of people have access to the internet, while in poor countries, a large part of the population does not. The issue is more complex because there are always internal differences in countries. For example, differences between connection in cities or in the countryside. In the European Union itself, there are also differences, and it could be said that in the global north, there is also a global south. In addition, there are other factors, not only economic, that influence access to the internet, such as age and gender. My experience about the digital divide has changed a lot since I started working in Proyecto Humboldt Digital, because until I traveled to Cuba, I didn't have a direct knowledge. Although there have been policies to improve internet access in Latin America, the reality is that in many countries, more than a half of the population does not have access to the internet, and those who do have access to the internet in public places, workplaces, and via mobile phones. The case of Cuba is especially dramatic because, in addition, we have to add the problem of the U.S. embargo. According to 2017 data, in Cuba, only 57% of the population has access to the internet, while in Germany, the figure reaches 89% according to data from 2018. I believe that the web has the, potential to be, has the potential to be a universal means of knowledge production. It has the potential to be universal in scope. But for a resource to be truly accessible, it is necessary to take into account what David G. Grizzly called the regional lack of knowledge infrastructure. He says um, that the practical capacity of knowledge actors in a society to produce information, original or in translation, in such fields as science, humanities, and the arts, to create regional scholarly communication venues and to disseminate that information openly and sustainably for the use and benefit of society is what he calls the regional lack of knowledge infrastructure. Finally, in addition to the digital divide, I believe that when we build digital repositories or digital editions or tutorials, open educational resources, we often think only of users without disabilities, that is, people who can hear, see, speak without difficulty or who do not have any motor limitations. This is an important issue that we should um, address uh, when thinking about barriers to access and use. Moving on, the third fair principle is interoperability. According to Force 11, 
to be interoperable means metadata and data use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Metadata and data use vocabularies that follow fair principles. Metadata and data include qualified references to other metadata and data. As can be seen, the three facets facets focus on the representation of knowledge with formalized languages, controlled vocabularies, and identifiers. The main difficulty is that these are interpretative and time-consuming tasks, but I think that they are all three, three facets very good points. Now, my criticism points to another area, the very definition of interoperability. From my point of view, the FAIR principles is a not very accurate definition. For me, and I think for many digital humanities practitioners, interoperability means that the different components of an infrastructure are compatible with each other, that is, that they can work together, communicate, exchange data, and so on. So, for example, in this um, slide, I try to model the infrastructure of the programming historian from an editor's point of view. In this project, we use GitHub to store files written in Markdown format, which contain the metadata in JAMN, which are validated by Travis or Travis, and transformed into HTML by Jekyll. So our tutorials are accessible on the web. The infrastructure of a digital repository built with Omica or DSpace can also be modeled from an administrator point of view. A digital repository typically stores information in a relational database, contains files in a number of standard formats, builds records in XML using the Dublin Core Metadata Schema, and publishes all content in HTML format on the web. In addition, these platforms are designed with, uh, with digital restoration as a priority and to allow data to be shared with aggregators using the Open Archives Initiatives protocol for metadata harvesting. In fact, this protocol can be considered a, a clear example of interoperability between different repositories via HTTP. In Project of Humboldt Digital, we not only want to digitize documents and records, but also transcribe and edit a selection of text in digital format. In this slide, I have tried to model from an administrator point of view how digital editions could be published on the web with the, with the TA Publisher tool. In this case, we will use an XML database to store files in XML TI format, validate um, them with a, with a schema, and publish on the web by transforming the files into to HTML. In conclusion, I believe that interoperability is a very complex term and, uh, and that it admits various um, interpretations. From my point of view, and here I distance myself from the FAIR principles, I believe that interoperability, the use of standards, file formats, and the building of a technological infrastructure go hand in hand. This is a definition we find, for example, in Andrew, Andrew L. Russell's book, Open Standards and the Digital Age, where the author states the following. Interoperability is the creation of compatibility standards for communication networks. Scholars who have studied the interconnection of various components of communication networks often use three concepts, infrastructure, platforms, and network effects, to describe the important role of standards that enable compatibility and interoperability. They emphasize the potential for a heap of standardized components to combine into a cohesive and flexible network that can, can, in turn, sustain more complex social and economic activity. Or to sum up, I think interoperability is a complex problem that cannot be isolated, but requires a more complete and inter interconnected vision that takes into account the existing infrastructure of the institution that is hosting the project. The last FAIR principle is to be reusable. But what exactly does this mean? Well, again, the FAIR principles focus on resource description and technical aspects. aspects. And interestingly, the principles mention the use of standards here for the first time. This principle has a single facet that is made up of three components. The facet is Metadata and data are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. And the, and the three components are metadata and data are released with a clear and accessible license. Metadata and data are associated with um, detailed provenance. And finally, metadata and data meet domain relevant community standards. 
My criticism here is the same as in the previous one. The description of resources is an interpretative act that requires specialized knowledge and time. And not all the humanities projects have um, these two valuable resources. But I would like to focus better on the components of the principle that deal with license, provenance, and the use of standards. Based on my experience as an editor, I believe that providing the license and provenance of a resource is not enough for it to be reused. What is really important is that there is a community of users interested in appropriating the resource. So, for example, the programming historian in Espanol, we started translating tutorials from English to Spanish in 2016. All of our tutorials are licensed under a Creative Commons license that allows reuse and we also provide information on authorship. In other words, according to the FAIR principles, we will have enough. Translating tutorials is a very creative task that requires adapting the text to work in Spanish. Translators usually change the text by adding new, new instructions, updating uh, to the tutorial if there is a new version of the program or tool, writing down the text to clarify doubts, or add Spanish um, bibliography, or bibliography in Spanish. All this involves a lot of work that is not compensated many many times because the university system doesn't reward remixing or reusing, but originality and innovation. Even so, there are researchers who believe in reusing because um, they consider that for the community, the resource can be useful. The importance of community leads us to reflect on the use of standards. The FAIR principles say that metadata must meet domain relevant community standards. Standards represent the consensus of a community of practice. It is a form of this, this style knowledge. But what community, community are we talking about? Who do these standards belong to when people in the global south face barriers to accessing the internet or using digital technologies? The use of standards in certain communities can lead to alienation and dependency, as Ernesto Priani, Priani advocates. He says, the problem of prioritizing academic integration at a global level over any other aspect of the use of standards involves four major issues. First, it is a factor in the disqualification of regional variants in favor of a single model of project development. Second, as a consequence of this, the normative use of standards and good practices reinforces the region's technological and academic dependence on Anglo-American countries. Third, it subordinates regional communities to a central community. And four, it prevents the creation of a research community by emphasizing the practical implementation of projects. My personal story confirms this narrative. I was born in Barcelona and I studied humanities, a humanities degree. When I wanted to study digital publishing, I learned how to create ebooks in EPA format and interactive books, um, interactive books with InDesign. But to learn, for example, TI, I had to take summer courses outside Spain because 10 years ago, very few researchers used TI to represent text and there were practically no courses. In other words, I had to appropriate a knowledge that belonged to a different community of practice. In this presentation, I have analyzed and illustrated with examples the four fair principles. My aim has been to establish a critical dialogue. From my point of view, I believe that building fair digital resources is a worthy task, but not without many difficulties. I also believe that researchers trying to build fair resources in the Global South will be confronted with fewer opportunities and many disadvantages due to the digital divide lack of infrastructure, and poor implementation of standards created in the Global North. Now, it is clear that building fair resources in the Global South is not easy. But what would you do if you worked in a digital humanities project that involves a North-South cooperation? In order not to replicate dominant power structures, I will start by simply asking myself these questions. Who is designing and managing the project and who is executing it? Who is giving or receiving training? Which quality standards, metadata schemes, and format files are used and why? Where is infrastructure, hardware, and software built and maintained? Where are the servers installed? 
In a digital humanities project of this kind, if all the decision-making authority, equipment, technologies, and infrastructure fall to the global north, it is very likely that the project is increasing inequalities rather than mitigate, mitigating them. I believe that there are three dangers that we must avoid by all means. Eurocentrism, cultural cloning, and extractive activities. Eurocentrism is based on the belief in the superiority of European culture. Anyone born in Europe tends to think this way because school, history, and the media place Europe at the center of the universe. Eurocentrism is a form of colonialism because it considers non-European cultures as inferior. I think it is important for researchers in the global north to deconstruct ourselves and think and think that other forms of knowledge are equally valid. A very simple example concerns the Spanish language. As editor of the programming historian, I have had I have had to reevaluate my beliefs when editing texts written by Latin American authors because their Spanish is different from a lexical, syntactic, and pragmatic point of view. That is, I have had to learn that Spanish is a diverse language and that all variants and usages are local. But another example of Eurocentrism may be simply to ignore the digital divide and think that everyone has access to the internet or can buy a personal computer. In other words, ignoring digital inequalities is Eurocentric. The second danger we must avoid is what is known as cultural cloning. That is the inclusion of the same because it reinforces our privileges. To avoid this, at the program historian, we have a diversity policy because we realized that we tended to integrate other members who were similar to us into the team. But I also believe that this practice should be avoided when choosing metadata schemes or technologies. In other words, I think it is dangerous to try to replicate technological infrastructures from the global north in the global south in the same way. The last danger that we must avoid is extractivism. Many digitization projects involve the purchase of document collections by institutions in Europe or in the global north to carry out uh, their digitization outside, outside their place of origin. There are also projects that install the servers in the global north, for example, in the United States, even though the digitized documents took place in Latin American countries, and these documents come from um, Latin American countries. These types of, pro of projects have good intentions, for sure, but I believe that they carry out forms of extraction of goods and that it is, and that it is more equitable, more fa fairer to invest in the local infrastructure. To close this talk, I would like to highlight just four conclusions that focus on our individual responsibility. One, digital humanities scholars need to imagine ways of mitigating the impact of inequalities on project development, communication, training, collaboration, and engagement. Two, digital humanities is not only about building. The field already has a long tradition of cultural criticism, but digital humanities scholars and practitioners should find time to read and quote each other's works. Three, digital humanities scholars should engage critically with guidelines for building digital resources. Compliance to quality standards is a desirable goal, but most of guiding principles are open to interpretation and debate. And fourth, digital humanities projects that involve North-South cooperation must avoid Eurocentrism, cultural cloning, and extractivism. They should support an ecology of knowledge instead, that is, an epistemology that acknowledges and respects differences. We live in an unequal world. This is why fairness can be contextual and vary according to communities. We need to listen and ask, is this digital humanities resource fair enough to you? Vielen Dank, thank you, gracias.